Hello, and welcome to the Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan for this week ending the whatever it is of July. It is the 25th of July. I've just checked on my phone and I had to look down because as those of you watching on YouTube might have noticed, we are live and in colour uh, for the first time and we'll see how long it lasts. It depends how nice you are to us in the comments. <laughs> Sarah, you're looking wonderful. How are you? I'm fine. I cannot complain. Um, yeah. It's been um, an interesting week, Lindsay. Another one. It's supposed to be quiet season, but it hasn't been, has it? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. I'm wondering when C Silly Season will be upon us and we can talk about lots of pop culture stuff and rubbish. Uh, but for the moment, yeah. we have to stick with the serious topics. I mean, we're going to talk in this episode a little bit about Sinn Féin uh, changing their immigration policy. I think that's very interesting and there's lots to say on that. We're going to talk about the Orsi bailout. We're going to talk about Kamala Harris and um, whether Sarah is like Kamala Brat. We'll come to that a little bit later on. Um, what else are we going to talk about, Sarah? We said we would discuss, I think... Um, Oh, we'll come. We'll remember. We'll remember later on in the show. But anyway, let's start with Sinn Féin. Were you were you impressed with their their new policy? Uh, no, not really. Um, I think we're still in the uh, trying to fix it and it's not working phase. Uh, Mary Lou had a another abysmal performance on radio. And in fairness to her, and we've said this loads of times on the podcast before, she's really good. She's a really solid performer most of the time. Like we would give credit where credit's due. But she had a terrible outing with um, Voucher Hayes uh, on radio. She had a couple leading up to the local and European elections as well. So she's not having a great time. And they've come out with this mealy mouth thing about Kulak where the public should be consulted, but they don't have a veto, which is, is I think, as confusing to you know the general public as it is to me. And um, so far, I think they're scrambling to try and make up some ground in advance of the general election that's rapidly approaching, approaching and I don't think it's working. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a couple of thoughts on it. I mean, the first one was that it's, it's it, what they're attempting to do, I think, is deeply cynical. So what they're yeah. saying is, what they're saying is, we shouldn't put any migrants into any areas where it's not suitable to have migrants um, or because the area is too deprived or there aren't enough resources or what have you. And or the places I, I, where we get the most votes. Yeah. 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 And I think there's going to end up being an awful lot like their policy when it comes to objecting to housing, which is conveniently nowhere would be suitable. So I think what's going to happen here is that this is basically Sinn Féin giving carte blanche to all its local TDs and local councillors to oppose every migration facility across the country on the same single transferable grounds that, you know, we can't have one here. Um, mm. While at the same time maintaining to their left flank the idea that there is actually a theoretical you know land of milk and honey out there somewhere that would be ideal for putting migrants, it's just that the government, the poor fools, haven't found it. So I think it's very cynical in that respect. I also share your view that it will come a little bit too little too late because I think a, a lot of protesters, a lot of people who are very energized about this issue, want actually to see it, see a more aggressive stance. So Ben Scallon um, asked Mary Lou about this issue of the veto earlier on in the week, and she was saying, no, 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 but you've a right to be consulted, but you don't have the right to say no. And as Ben said, what's the point then? It's just the government's policy with extra plomosing. But I think in practical terms, what it's going to be is we oppose everything. Um, mm. And we do it on these grounds that are like, I think the Irish Times in an, an editorial, in fairness, I very rarely would quote an Irish Times editorial. They said it was deeply cynical. I think they're right, um, but I'm not sure it'll work. I mean, it's, you know, it's no more or less cynical than what the government parties do on this issue, to be fair. But yeah, it's not going to work. And I think, you, you know, not to go over old ground because we've discussed it loads of times before, but the disappointment, the disengagement that they're, the Sinn Féin voter has with Sinn Féin at the moment isn't going to be fixed, I don't think, at all in this election cycle. But it's certainly not going to be fixed by this kind of like half in, half out approach. The voters are more sophisticated than that. They're more disappointed than that's ever going to, you know, remedy. And I think that they're still at sea in how they get back the hardcore voter that's left them and um, they don't know how to do it and it's showing up. And I think that Mary Lou's, you know, really bad performances on radio are a symptom of the fact that they're flailing in the wind and they don't know how to recover. And, you know, it's easy. I mean, it's not easy, but it's easier to be a good media performer when the wind's behind you, when you're going out. Like we've always said, she had an unbelievably good general election the last time around. You go out, you're meeting the people. The wind is behind you. You've got momentum. Everything's great. It's easy to go into RTE like, you know, Billy Big Balls and, 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 and do solid, amazing performances then. 
But when you're in a kind of a crisis like this, you really start to see, and that's not to diminish her abilities, but you just really start to see the panic. And I think that you go from, you, you kind of fall from one bad media performance to the next, one flailing outing to the next. And it's really hard to get back up and recover in, t- in time for the next one. And I think that that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I mean, I was struck by, um, I, I didn't I didn't listen in full to the Boucher Hayes performance, but I actually thought she had a reasonable complaint. I thought that he was he was trying to trip her up. Uh, he was very clearly mm-hmm. like focusing on issues like you know costs and achievability, and you know, you, which you never hear RT focusing on when it comes to the government. You know, then it's about yeah. the, the the idea, you know, the, the the general trend of the policy, and you know, obviously we'll we'll, ha- we'll allocate the resources to make it happen. Like, when does the government care about next? When does the RT really care about an extra ten million here or twenty million there in terms of public funding, unless it's going into their own pockets, which will come to. Um, mm-hmm. So I did think I did think it was persnickety, and I thought it was was kind of, you know snooty interviewing but at the same time i think the problem is that mary lou is deeply dis- deep, deeply uncomfortable on this issue like it was notable that a day or two before she announced the policy she put out this press statement saying that she'd spoken to a load of people in kulak um and she'd gone and she'd listened to the locals and all of the people who are protesting and actually engaged in activism opposing this proposed migrant center said well you didn't talk to us and so I sent the yeah. I, I personally sent the Sinn Féin press office an email and I said, Can you tell me please who Mary Lou met with in Kulak? And no response. Now they very rarely respond to our to our um um our emails requesting information. They never send us any press notices of Sinn Fein events that are happening. They they do they they go out of their way to avoid engaging with us here at Grips, and that's fine. You're entitled to do that. But, you know, if there was an answer to that question that made her look better, I think it would have been sent to me and it wasn't. So I think the problem for Mary Lou is that she's trying to win votes of people she still fundamentally doesn't want to talk to. She doesn't want to go to Kulak and talk to people who are upset about the about the the, the immigration issue. She wants to go and talk to people in organizations, you know, the ones that remember the ones that were set up last year, like the the Dublin for all groups. Um, who are kind yeah. of set up to to campaign for more immigration. That's who she's more comfortable talking to. Um, and I think, you know, people get that. They instinctively get it. And, and uh, Kevin Myers has a column coming out in Grip uh, over the weekend, which is in typical Kevin style, scathing about Sinn Féin. But one of the things he says in it is that Sinn Féin are now out here advocating policies that six weeks ago they would have denounced as borderline fascism. Um, yeah. And he's right. So, I mean, I think people will, people will, a lot of people, some people will fall for it, uh, or some people will be satisfied with it. Maybe fall for it is too harsh, but a lot of people won't be. I don't think anyone's going to fall for it. I mean, I said on the podcast before that exactly where the Crown Paints factory is, when you drive up behind that, that's the street I drove on during the local and European elections that I mentioned on this podcast before, where there was multiple posters, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael. And the Sinn Féin ones were the only ones that the face had been spray painted black. And mm-hmm. the, like these are posters that were on, like there'd be three posters on a pole and just the Sinn Féin one would be spray painted. And it wasn't like it was the lowest one. Someone had actually gone out of their way to spray paint only the Sinn Féin one. There's a lot of anger there. I, I, I don't think Mary Lou would be met with any kind of welcome around those areas at all. So not to say that she's not telling the truth, but I mean, I think that you know, her relationship with those kind of communities is severely damaged. And I don't think anything that she's doing right now is going to make um, any difference whatsoever to their current polling position. None of that is going to make a difference. So, uh, but I do think you're right. And I thought it myself that I I like my politicians, all of them to be, you know, to be put under scrutiny and rigorous questioning when it comes to their policy platforms. So I think you are right in the sense that I don't think that a Fina Gaylor was would be put under that kind of sneery kind of line of questioning that she was. I think you're right. But at the same time, you know, it no, is what it but, is. Put it this way. When did you see an RTE presenter bring in a government politician and say to them, look, the people of Kulak don't want this centre to be here? When did you ever hear an RT presenter say to to a, to a politician, look, a couple of years ago, the people of Kulak were promised that that centre would be transformed into apartments and retail and shopping and a major investment put in. That was all done away with and now it's a migrant centre. Shouldn't they be angry? You, you never hear a government politician ask that kind of question. You never be asked, you never hear RT ask about ultimate capacities. So what happens when all the 30 centres you want to open are filled up? Um, so the hostile questions are always reserved 
for people on, and it's not anti-government necessarily, because I mean, if the Sock Dems come on with their anti-government spiel of kind of like, oh, well, you know, we shouldn't be racist and we should bring in far more people, or she aren't going to give them any hard questions, even though they're anti-government. It is anti-government mm. for a particular segment that all she's hackles will raise. And you saw that happen with Philip Boucher Hayes, um, I think with yeah. Mary Lou McDonald. And I think she's every right to be upset about it, even though I do think her new immigration policy is deeply, deeply cynical. Um, yeah, and I think that she was sent, she shouldn't have gone on radi radio without all of her facts and figures ready. And it was a bit poor in that sense as well. Yeah, yeah but I mean, that's been a problem for them for a while now. When was the last time Mary Lou McDonald had a convincing radio outing? I mean, well, again, it comes back to the point that I've said to you before, which is that maybe, you know, there was a period of time, you know, was it a year ago? Was it slightly less than a year ago where Sinn Féin were spending, seemed to be spending their time and resources on preparing to govern instead of offering opposition? So, you know, a good start might be to go back to learning how to be opposition because hmm. they seem to have wasted a lot of time on, you know, measuring the sofa for their offices. Yep. Ministerial offices. So. They did. Yeah. Well, people who are getting new sofas, I'll do one of my world famous segues. Um, I suspect <laughs> they'll certainly be able to afford them are our good friends in the aforementioned RTE who ha are going to receive, I think, a total of three quarters of a billion over the next couple of years, which amounts to 140 million more than they'd have gotten had uh, had um, they never had a financial scandal to begin with in the first place. What did you make of that? It's a lot of flip flops, isn't it? Um, I think. I mean, I suppose I'm sort of equal parts depressed and angry that we have this major scandal for a brief moment. And I, I know you're going to disagree because you're maybe a bit more cynical about RT than I am. But for a brief moment, it felt like there might be some kind of reform. A lot of people and unexpected people started to say they weren't going to pay their license. And, you know, we just had this this brief period where it felt like change might be upon us. And instead of that, we've gone back to you know and I I really am beginning to think that it should just be not allowed on radio to say um the government are giving the money we're giving the money we're we're giving the money they're giving the state isn't funding it we're funding it mm -hmm. and we're funding it more than ever and we're we're you know there is no other situation I can think of where a so-called business or organization would be rewarded with the type of poor governance and performance that we saw last year with more money so for me this is like the bank bailout I mean a couple of years ago back in the in the early 2010s late late noughties we bailed out failing banks and now we're failing out, bailing out a failing broadcaster, literally giving hundreds of millions of euro, um, which is not as much as we gave the banks, but the principle is the same, to an organization that cannot sustain itself. And what's worse than that is that the failures we're bailing out are, are basically the same. That the banks were in trouble because of, of management failures um, and incompetence and bad decisions. And RTE is in trouble because of management failures and incompetence and bad decisions. And it's it's not only just that, it's also the fact that they've insulted the democratic process because they consistently refused to appear before uh, Iraq's committees. Information had to be dragged out of them. We have various people in the organization who've been you know, struck down by mystery illnesses that go on and on and on forever. And this government turns around and actually financially rewards them for it, increases the amount of money they're getting. It's a fucking disgrace. I mean, there's no other word for it. Um, it, it is a, it's a scandal on the body politic. It's a decision that should follow these people around like a bad smell for the rest of their careers. And and what what you know, the thing that really gets me here, Sarah, is is that you know why is this happening? Um, I mean, is there a single politician who thinks that or she is doing sports better than satellite competitors, or that is doing entertainment better than Netflix or Amazon, or that is doing news better and faster than the internet? No. We all know why this is happening, and it is because the government believes or he is absolutely a bulwark against people like you and me, and against people like people in Kulak. It is there, as they see it, to be a bulwark for the Irish state the way it's ever been. And it is it is beyond corrupt, um, this decision. And I mean, so much so that you had, uh, you had Catherine Martin really struggling to defend it at a press conference yesterday. In fact, she didn't really defend it. She just stuck to the lines that were in front of her. And most of the questions that she were asked she was asked weren't answered to the extent that she couldn't even answer where the money was going i mean so i mean you know the french riot over stuff um and i generally am not fa a fan of it but if ever if ever like you know public protests were called for i think it's this decision which means of course there won't be any um i i, I just think it's disgusting 
And what was all that for? All the stuff with RT and all the revelations and the flip flops and the money and, you know, Ryan Tuberty and all of it. What was it all for? Nothing. Yeah, what was for Ryan exiled? I mean, they should have, they should have kept him and, and tripled his salary, you know, because yeah. he's worth it. I mean, they can afford to do and it now. And I also think that, like, you know, to be fair to Virgin Media and News Talk and different things, like, it's a kind of offensive to them. You know what I mean? Why, like, they're not, they're not in receipt of these big government amounts of money. You know what I mean? And they're still offering news. And, you know, we've discussed before you go into the difference when you go into T- Virgin and you go into uh, RTE, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like, it's so, like you've bad governance, you've bad management of money. You're not honest. You're not, uh, you didn't cooperate with the with the so-called investigation that was done. And, and our answer to that is going to be to give you more money. Yeah. Like what's, what's the point? Like, what's the point? Next time people start getting, like, you just become more and more cynical. Like, next time people start getting their panties in a wad about something else, I'm just going to go, oh, what's the point? Don't, don't, don't get excited. Don't let it bother you because everything's going to stay the same. Don't worry about it. Yeah, well, it's a moral hazard, isn't it? I mean, there's the old concept of moral hazard, which is that failure should be punished. Otherwise, you're encouraging failure. And what the government has just done this week is they said, yeah, failure will not only be tolerated, it'll be rewarded. So it's the same for every other. This is the this is the precedent that's being set for every other semi-state. Irish Water make a mess, you know. Well, there's the OTE precedent. Bus Air and CIE, whatever they're called, they make a mess. It's the there's the there's the there's the precedent. Every single one of them, um, you're setting this precedent that you know failure will be tolerated and reforms won't be demanded if they're politically inconvenient or politically difficult. And by the way, I don't even see how reforming OTE is a politically difficult decision. I mean, so so the reason that it's not being taken isn't because they're afraid they'll lose votes. It's because they actually don't want to reform RTE. They're happy with the massive sprawling monstrosity that it is because they know it still just about dominates the national conversation and that must be maintained at all costs. And I'm sorry if that sounds conspiratorial, but I mean, I've talked to politicians off the record who tell me that's the truth. <laughs> that, you yeah. know, they are afraid... They are afraid that were RTE not to be there, the conversation might start to be dominated by the wrong sort of element. And they don't necessarily just mean you and me. They mean Eamon Dunphy with his podcast. With his podcast. They mean, um, you know, on the left, they mean people like Blind Boy and so on. They're afraid that they lose the adults in the room, even though the adults in the room are incompetent children. Um, so, yeah. And every time anybody says anything, they just say, we need public service broadcasting over and over again, as if, you know, we're, you're, that by asking for any kind of, you know, accountability, cost saving or, you know, rigor when it comes to the finances of RTE, you're, it's as if you're asking for no hospitals, you know. Oh, well, we yeah. need public service broadcasting. Oh, well, we need certain public service. Like, that's the kind of killer argument whenever you say anything. Oh, well, we need, I, oh, oh, well, we believe in public service broadcasting. So who said yeah. I didn't? And the funny thing is, that there's a simple one word response to that, which I have asked several politicians and I can't get an answer from them. You know what I mean? Why? Why do we need public service broadcasting? Because if you can stand there and you can explain that in a coherent way that doesn't involve the words misinformation, disinformation, and the far right, you know, be my guest. But and then, and by the way, yeah. more TV, what a joke. Um, yeah, look. Um, so I mean, I, I, just for the record, I'm still not going to pay my TV license. Which means that if you, Sarah, are paying your TV license, you'll actually be paying mine as well. Because this is the other way. This is the other the other thing about the way this has been set up is that the way the funding has been structured is if you pay your TV license, then that money goes straight towards you. But if you don't pay your TV license, the government is going to take the money that you would have paid and give it towards you. So essentially, if you're one of those suckers out there who's paying your TV license, you're paying it twice. And normally, I'd feel really bad about that. I have to say, normally, I'd feel really bad about that. I don't want anyone paying my bills for me. But you know what? I, I just don't consider this my bill. I don't watch RTE. I never will watch RTE. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of space. I wouldn't pay for it in the private sector. I'm not going to pay for it now. So if somebody else wants to pay twice on my behalf, go ahead, because that's what the government is making you do. And I think that's a that's another disgrace that people don't really understand as of yet, but they may come to understand pretty soon. So you're paying twice. So really, people should be encouraged not to pay. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, the, the way it works is the way it works is right. You pay your you pay your taxes. I pay my taxes. You get a TV yeah. license thing in the post. I get a TV license thing in the post. You pay your hundred and sixty five euros. I tie rip it up and throw it in the bin. Um, well, then 
the government pays out of your taxes my share of the TV license fee. So only some of that comes out of my taxes, but some of it comes out of yours as well. So you're effectively subsidizing my not paying uh, from your own taxes while you pay it yourself. That's the system they've set up. That's good. Um, Add it to the list. But what was interesting about the RTE thing was this sort of minor drama that erupted at that press conference. Um, And there's been a lot of, I don't know if you've seen, but there's been a lot of um, um, nonsense, you go girl stuff about Catherine Martin on Twitter in the last 24 hours because she gave out to Fiona Sheehan for allegedly shouting at her. Mm. Um, First of all, I watched it and he wasn't even talking to her. So that's the first thing he was talking to one of her advisors. I think it's, um, and I, I think this term is overused, but I'm going to use it because it, a lot of people understand it. I think it's pure gaslighting to pretend to end, you know, like she's trying to draw this kind of card like, oh, I, I, I'm always respectful. And, uh, you know, you can't like you're shouting at me or whatever. First of all, he wasn't shouting at her. Second of all, you're a minister and you've just come out and announced that you're spending 750 million euro of taxpayers money on, you know, a new a new um, bailout, as you say, for RTE uh, in light of within 12 months of a number of massive scandals when it comes to their finances. And you know, I think like it was it, it was clear that she was late to the press conference, but he wasn't giving out about the fact that she was late to the press conference. He was giving out about the fact that whoever was running the press conference for her was ending the questions prematurely when journalists still had mm. questions. Now, like I don't like, you know, you and I've said on the podcast before, I like Fiona and I've always found Fiona to be like really easy person to deal with and a really easy person to talk to. Is he a bit gruff sometimes? Yeah, OK, fine. But like you're the minister. And you're on stage talking about 750 million euro. If the journalists want you to stay and answer more questions, like surely that's not a big deal. And she just plays the Trump card, which is like you're shouting at me and and then says, this is why more people don't get into politics, knowing that that will play to the gallery of like lovies who think that women are so put upon and he's just a big meanie and whatever. Well, if you can't take hard questioning, you can't take someone giving out at a press conference when you're spending that much of our money, well, then piss off home. Sorry. No. I don't buy it. I think it plays to this nonsense of women and women don't get into politics because someone's bitch. Have you ever had any idea how many men were mean to me in my career or gave out to me? It's 750 million euro for RTE. If there's 20 more questions, you owe it to the public, the people who elect you, the people whose money you're spending to answer those questions. And if tempers get heated or whatever, and he's giving out because your guy is trying to end the press conference, well, tough, tough. And I see all I see is, yeah, you go, girl, standing up. This is why people don't enter enter politics. People don't enter politics because they don't want to get given out to. So it, it's it's gaslighting. It's just pretending that this is the reason why people don't, don't get into politics because, you know, that'll play well with the gallery of lovies on Twitter mm. talking about how boys are mean to them. And, you know, if you're not able to be given out to, you shouldn't be in politics in the first place. Go canvassing once and they'll sort that out for you. You'll realize yeah. you're not, you know. And by the way, it's it's utter hypocrisy. Can I just say that? It's utter hypocrisy. Because where was she when Liz Truss was being roared at and called a lettuce and called a cabbage? I mean, I'm not a Liz Truss fan at all. I think a, a lot of the, the criticism directed at Liz Truss was entirely justified. I didn't see Catherine Martin standing up and going, oh, this is really bad for women in politics. And consider how unattractive it makes politics for other women. Bullshit. You sat in a press conference, as usual. And by the way, I have watched hours of Catherine Martin press car- conference footage. Because, like, you know, Ben goes along to them, you get the recordings back in, look at look what was said. I've watched hours of her lunch. She is unable to answer a question. She is yeah. unable to deal with information or worldviews that don't, uh, don't accord with her own. There have been multiple reports from her own department that her civil servants think she's not necessarily up to it. And... Her, and very clearly, she has a press officer who is aware of all these things and is trying to shut down questioning as much as possible, which, by the way, is his job. To be fair, that press com- press officer is just trying to protect his minister because she needs protecting. Because she's not somebody like, in fairness to Simon Harris, who can stand up there and bat away seven or eight questions, or in fairness to Michael Martin, who can engage in an argument back and forward, even though he's here, you know, we might agree with him, but he can do it. Um, or indeed, she's not even like Eamon Ryan. She is, it doesn't matter that she's a woman. She is not up to dealing with press scrutiny, which is why she's protected from it, which is why she went insane. Uh, sorry, why, sorry, sorry, she didn't go insane. But why um, Fionn Sheehan kind of flipped his lid a little bit and, and finally his frustrations overflowed. And I'm glad it was him. 
And I'm glad it was him because you said about Fionnan that you know he's he's somebody who can be a bit gruff. He is also the only person in the media with the credibility and the ability to stand up and make that point. Because you know, if Ben had done it, it would have been oh, right wing gripped media um, picks fight with minister, disgraceful, throw them out. Or if it had been some poor you know young reporter from the Mirror or the Star or even a junior reporter from the Irish Times, it would be who does she think she is? No, Fiona Sheen was the only one who could do it, uh, which is why I'm glad he did it because he's the only one who and can stand up for the rest of them in there. Yeah, and also w w when you watch it, he's actually defending another female reporter being able to ask a question. Yeah. And instead of yeah. people actually watching it and saying, like, you know, we've said before, I say it again, he's very fair. He's a good journalist and he wants a rigor to the questioning that we're complaining doesn't exist in other places. And instead she plays the trump card, which is, you know, and, and, and listen, I could do it. Uh, like, you know, many times in my career, it's basically... You're being mean and I don't like I don't shout at you and you're shouting at me and this is mean and this is why people don't do this. And it's a real like killer blow because yeah. then everything he says from then on looks like, you know, he's kind of being a bully and then everybody online loves it because it's a great soundbite. And it's all Fionnan's fault that more women don't enter politics because he's being mean because I'm just up here trying to spend 750 million of your of your money without any accountability to it. And you're being mean to me. Yeah. You know, Fair play yeah. to Fionnan. We need more Fionnans. That's what I say. I would tend to agree in this instance. Yeah, I don't think the minister has a leg to stand on there. But I mean, it's the usual, it's the usual gaslighting bullshit, isn't it? You know, oh, the, the, the person asking the hard questions, he's the meanie, and the person spending the seven hundred and fifty million quid and unable to account for it is the victim. I mean, yeah. spare me this country and the state of politics and the media in it. Anyway, we better talk about another country. Worse. It's getting worse because years ago, ministers wouldn't have gotten away with that. And it's starting to feel like there's a level of contempt for the public that they don't have to answer questions. And that's manifesting in his frustration. And that's why he's getting annoyed. And he's right. Yeah. And by the way, it, it, you know, I'm quite sure it would take probably the opposite view to RT funding than, than you and I. I suspect he is in favour of yeah. an inverted commas public service broadcasting because they all are. But at least he has enough wherewithal to, to understand that you know, this is public money and needs to be accounted for. Uh, so I mean, point, full credit to point isn't about, Yeah, the point isn't about RT funding. The point is about the rigour and the questioning and how ministers are accountable to the public when they do make, when they make large decisions that affect all of us. And, mm. you know, he, he said, he said in the press conference, you know, you do this with the budget. So this isn't, he outlined that the pattern to her not answering questions that he's gotten frustrated from. He didn't just wake up in a bad mood and start to, you know, have a tantrum. He's, he laid out his point which is that there's a pattern to the way those press conferences are run that she doesn't answer questions properly and he's a journalist and it's his job to report the news and if they don't answer questions it makes his job more difficult and it makes our democracy less so good for him yeah by the way it's my one final point on Catherine Martin before we move on which is this that she's persistently as well giving away the powers of her office so she set up this body called Com Commission the Man we are the commission mm. to regulate the media, which is an absolute monstrosity of an organization. I mean, its budget calls for it to have 165 employees by the end of next year. I mean, there are there are multi-million dollar companies in this, multi-billion dollar, multi-million euro companies in this jurisdiction that don't have that many employees. It's, and this is to regulate the Irish print and online sphere. Um, it's gotten, it's, it's being granted massive powers to regulate sort of speech and advertising and compare with people who are receiving state money to to have diversity quotas and uh, you know all sorts of bullshit basically um and it's been handed over and will outlive her and will outlive the election it's been put on the statutory footing and you know i don't know who it's accountable to i don't know who you can complain about it to because it's been given basically the authority of the government but no one no one elects it so i mean i i think this minister is um is a sh is, is a disaster and um you know i'm glad i'm glad that somebody finally called her to, to called her to task for her pattern not answering questions anyway we'll talk about another country so we can cool down a little bit um Kamala Harris is brat apparently Sarah are you brat I don't know what this means so you're gonna have to explain it to me it's going you to see this is, this is this is this is the thing like I kind of feel like you and I are getting so old that we don't understand what the kids are talking about these days so so when, when Kamala Harris became the vice president became the candidate for president of the United States you're familiar with a woman called Charlie XCX I presume yeah yeah, she's a singer. So her 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 um her her album this year is called Brass. Um and apparently this is a massive thing. And that if you are called Brass 
and you're part of the brat girl summer, then you are cool as hell. And I mean, the evidence for this is the tweet has been seen something like 60 million times with multiple million likes and retweets. Um, and Kamala Harris has actually changed her campaign's Twitter account to all green to what's called a brat theme. Um, because this is how you connect with the kids now, apparently. So I went and looked up. I went and looked up what brat means. And I went, I found it in The Guardian. And the guard it says the archetypical brat, Charlie XCX explained on TikTok, is quote, just like that girl who is a little messy and likes to party and maybe says some dumb things sometimes, who feels herself, but then also maybe has a breakdown, but then kind of parties through it. And that's who I'm talking to when I say brat. Well, that sounds more like Donald Trump than Kamala Harris, to be honest, doesn't it? Why would a politician want to be associated with that? Um, well, uh, as I say, 52, 53 million views on social media. Um, but I, 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 the reason I'm highlighting it is... Why party gets messy and then parties through it? Has a breakdown as well. Don't forget that bit. Well, it sounds kind of... like that Dylan Mulvaney song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. The kind of girl as a bloke you might be attracted to briefly in your very early 20s and then grow out of, is what it sounds like to me. Um, kind of chaotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Chaos energy. I think it was just some, yeah, messy and who likes drama, I think was the phrase that used to be used to, be used to describe such people. But yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it speaks to something bigger, which is I think actually Kamala Harris is being underestimated a little bit. Because and I, and I'll tell you why my, that's my theory. My theory is because you didn't know what brat is. Now that's a very weak basis for theory. Granted that much, Sarah doesn't know what brat is. Therefore, you know my theory is correct. But I think there is. Um, if you look at the way the election is going, the gender gap is enormous. Donald Trump in the most recent NBC poll is leading with men by I think fifty six percent to thirty eight percent. Um, but Kamala Harris, and this was the first poll taken after she came out um, and, and became the only, is leading with women by, I think, 54 to 42. Um, and they're divided by a point or two nationally. And my point is that I don't know if Donald Trump has much room to grow with men, but I think Kamala Harris is banking on the fact that she's a lot of room to grow with women. And I'm also afraid the Donald Trump campaign might just be playing into that when J.D. Vance um, says things like, she's a crazy cat lady. No, that wasn't great, was it? No. No. Um, I don't know what that is because a uh, brat is or whatever, because I'm not a moron. And I think that a pres a female, the first female presidential or potential first female president, um, but the a female presidential candidate for president of the United States looks moronic to say the least, to associate herself with that kind of garbage. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, come on, like, please. So I don't, I, I, I mean, if that's playing well with a certain type of stupid voter, I mean, is there, are you honestly suggesting that there's women out there who are going to, thinking about voting for Kamala Harris and then see that she's self identifies as a brat and now thinks, yeah, she's cool, I'm going to vote for her. Is there people who are that stupid? No, but I don't think that's how it works. I think, I think, I think, in particular, when the left do well, it is because people people think voting is about a social signifier of who they are, and they develop these kind of movements. Like the Obama movement was a huge one, obviously, where it was kind of all about saving the world and the light bringer and stopping the oceans from rising. And voting was about you know you know changing the world. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that you know nobody was ever going to argue that a, a vote for Joe Biden was going to change the world and stop the oceans from rising and bring world peace, which is why I think he was struggling with young people. Whereas I think what they're trying to do with Kamala, with the brass thing, with the kind of like you know the the you know, feminist energy stuff is to try and create, and, and I think abortion is going to play a huge role in the campaign for her as well. So they're trying to create that kind of repeal jumper energy we saw in Ireland in 2018. Um, and, you know, as somebody who, who, who stood in the face of that, it's, 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 it's quite hard to overcome once that momentum gets rolling. Now, the, 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 the flip side of that is Kamala Harris is an absolutely terrible campaigner and a terrible communicator. So she, it might be more difficult for her to do that than you might think. But yeah, I just think if she was to grow her support with women by three or four more points, then you know, this idea that it's done and dusted for Trump becomes very dicey all of a sudden. I think what you're seeing is she's out of the traps. She's out of the traps fast. They're trying, they're throwing a lot of things at the wall, seeing what sticks. 
um, I think she's going to run out of kind of there's an interest that's there for the first couple of weeks that's going to not last uh, for her. Um, I know that the Democrats always get a bounce from their convention and stuff like that, but I mm-hmm. just don't think that she's... Um, I mean, I distinctly remember us at least talking on the phone, but maybe even on this podcast about the fact that the impression was a year and a half ago that she wasn't able to be put out there too much because she was so terrible at being VP. Mm. Yeah. And that they, they couldn't trust her and she was a bit of a disaster. And now all of a sudden, I mean, it's like talk about the, you know, ability of the media to kind of polish a turd, as they say. Um, all of a sudden now she's wonderful and the great hope for the future. And she's this and videos of her dancing around and she's, you know, it's just such a progressive, amazing thing or whatever. So I think that they're trying to sort of you know see what works see where she lands see what you know see what captures the imagination when it comes to Kamala and I don't I don't I think apart from maybe a bit of a bunch a bump with their convention and by the way I think Trump has this problem in a way as well in that I think Trump has a lot there's a lot of time left to go and he doesn't have a lot of things that are going to give him big bumps um but neither does she really and I think that she's less interesting and I think he is better he will beat her at a debate do you think that? I'm not so sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think she can. I mean, I'm there. Right, I got the last debate entirely wrong. So you listen to what I say with a pinch of salt on this topic. But I do think that she can at least stand and deliver the lines other people write for her better than 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 the the current president can. Um, she's not going to she's not going to fall apart in the way that he did. Um, and I also think Trump has has scoped what his foot in it. Um, I, I think his surrogates have scoped with his foot in it. I saw yesterday there was a guy on Fox Business, and I wrote about this for, if, you, if you're reading Grip this morning, you're watching this on Friday, you'll see I wrote about this. There was a guy on Fox Business, who just a regular middle-class white guy, business analyst, who decided to say that um, Kamala Harris was the OG Hawk Tua girl. Now, you know who the Hawk Tua girl is, I presume? Yes. You do, um, and listeners may not. But basically, uh, this was a way of him suggesting that she had she had used oral sex to get to to advance her career. And of course, well, like, I, know, hate all, I hate all that shit. I hate all that shit. I don't care. You, I don't care. You do, you do, and you know, you're a female, you're a female voter, and you hate it. And but this guy was getting like you know I saw his tweet saying oh I wasn't hard enough on her I'm glad somebody finally said it like some like seventy thousand likes loads of retweets all the Trump bros congratulating and patting him on the back and they have no fucking idea how much that pisses off regular women and and I, I'm yeah. not talking about kind of like liberal women I'm talking about the reaction you just had to it like, I, 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 it, it will, there will be a lot of that stuff. It, that will be thrown at her, and um, I think I think that there's a very easy way how the Trump bros, and I say the Trump bros, not Trump, fumble this election. Yeah, there there definitely is. I think there's loads of ways to challenge her. I mean, I think that the if people are curious about what I mean, look up a video of her saying, "Um, what we can be unburdened by what has been." Uh, it's basically this stupid phrase that she says over and over again when she's kind of obviously trying to be Obama or something and it just makes her look like an idiot, complete idiot. Like, I think there's loads of ways to attack her and just talking about anything like that. I don't care. Maybe she had relationships. But I don't care. Um, it's just base. Now, by the way, you know, like people dig in the past of Trump and have done and provided really old recordings of him saying stuff uh, that you know t- as proof of his character today it's been done but either way well, no matter way or what way it goes I just don't like it and I think there's plenty of e- low hanging fruit when it comes to her she's not a good performer no. she says stupid stuff she has made um, a number of like silly gaffes when it comes to Ukraine and Russia and lots of other things um, I think that her um, regardless of your um, views on the matter. I think her not showing up to greet Netanyahu and, and and not being involved in that will play really badly with a lot of with a lot of voters. Um, so there's lots to go in, and and whether or not she had a relationship or who she what she did and speaking about her former sex life in that way is just crass and boring and stupid. It's funny you mentioned the Netanyahu thing because I, I thought I thought what what was interesting was I've just discussed obviously a way I think Trump supporters actually can do him harm and may well do him harm, but yeah. her supporters on the other side, the sort of the the the, the lefties burning American flags outside the United States Congress, you know, and chanting burning, Allah Allah Akbar or whatever or Allah. Yeah, I, I mean like. Something? 
I, I think they were chanting um, in praise sure. of Allah as, as well, yeah. and, and sort of there was those various various effigies that were clearly stereotypically Jewish being burned as well, even though they would say that wasn't the case. I mean, very clearly the case. You can see them with your own eyes. Um, they are but, burning the American flag, and yes. they, because I saw a tweet about it, and then it said that they were chanting about Allah, and I said that's not true. And I went in and listened to it myself, and they are. Yeah, I mean, I don't think okay. that's the kind of thing. I think I don't think it would necessarily go out well in Dublin if you had a bunch of lads burning the Irish flag and chanting Allahu Akbar or whatever. And, and we didn't even have nine eleven, so I think the imagery that that sends in a country like that, um, a country like the United States, with its general attitudes to the world and like people have a very different view of the world than they do here. Um, yeah, I, I just I, you know I, I think that's you know if I was Donald Trump, I'd just play that video like a few hundred thousand times in the swing states. And say, yeah. look, it's 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 me or it's me or them, um, and I, you know, so so yeah, it's, it just feels like a lot of people have lost their mind at the moment, to be honest. And then, did you see? Uh, what did you make of, of of Uncle Joe's actual kind of address to the nation, where he said, you know, that he 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 was standing down, but he didn't actually say why. He never could bring himself to say that he thought he'd lose the election or anything like that. Well, first of all, I was starting to really suspect that he was dead. You know, look, and I don't you're, normally. You're I like no I really like well that no that he I was starting to suspect that there was something really wrong and I don't normally fall into the kind of conspiracy theory stuff on the internet but it was 5 days like yeah but you no know, and he resigned the presidency basically by a tweet like was there a coup because if it was if it was any other country in the world, and the 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 president just like announced they weren't running via a press conference, a press release on Twitter, and then wasn't seen for five days. People would ask questions. Yeah, but I, I think people people fall for that stuff. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying. I think people are too willing to believe that, like, if the president of the United States was uh, on his deathbed, that they'd be covering it up. They wouldn't. I wouldn't think they'd be covering it up. Um, I, I don't think that's what I think. I think you know, you, there's a fiduciary duty to inform the cabinet. There's a fiduciary duty to inform the vice president. I mean, think about when when Queen Elizabeth dies uh, in the UK. I mean, like we all had the fair idea she was dying when BBC came on on eleven o'clock in the morning or whatever with your man wearing a black tie. Who was your fair yeah. idea what's happening there? So I think a, a situation like that where 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 the president of the United States is is actually dying. God forbid that day ever comes. Um, you know, I think we will know. I don't think they'll be able to hide it. I mean, to, to what end? To what, what would the possible benefit of that been? I mean, no, if, I, if he I, if I saying was uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not talking to you. Uh, but like, there were a lot of people saying this stuff. But like, what what is the possible benefit of covering it up if he was sick? But yeah, it was odd that he went to ground. He was clearly a little bit. Um, I I I have more about the impression he didn't want to talk to anyone after he withdrew. That it really pissed him off having to pull out. Yeah, or they couldn't trust that he would or wouldn't say. I mean, ultimately, I think it's overall the whole thing is kind of the end. It was, it's, you know, it's sad, sad for him, sad for his family. The whole thing is, you know, like must have been a difficult decision to make. But um, I think that Kamala as the replacement is just, you know, a desperate replacement. <laughs> yeah, but she's this is the thing. This is the thing. She's an upgrade on him. I mean, however bad she is, she's an upgrade. I mean, this is the thing. I'm, I'm like, I, I, this is where I kind of I disagree with the conventionalism. I think there's so much conventionalism kind of on the right side of politics that it's a done deal. Trump is going to win. You know, can't be stopped. I think there's a. I, I think he's the favorite. Don't get me wrong. So don't misquote me. I think he's the favorite to win. I think he's a narrow favorite to win. But I absolutely think there's a scenario where she wins this election. Because his approval ratings are not great. He has run twice. He's never gotten more than 46.9% of the vote nationally. Uh, the, the, there's clearly, with the amount of money that's come into her campaign, which we haven't talked about in the last couple of days, enormous momentum behind her um, and, uh, you know, financially. They'll have a massive ground turnout game. They'll have early voting going out the doors. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think people who are saying she can't win are ignoring the fact that she's a very real upgrade over the guy she just replaced. And he wasn't that far behind. Yeah, but I think that this, like I said, like this early early momentum, bit of excitement. I think the Democrats and a lot of people who are Democrat voters or, or 
or you know advisors or whatever had almost gotten to the point where if it was going to be Joe they practically conceded the election and now there's a bit of hope that maybe you know maybe it's back in play and I think what you're seeing is a lot of money like flowing in as kind of a you know a bit of excitement that maybe it's back in play but I think that over the next next couple of weeks that there's there's got to be a reason and I wasn't paying that, that much attention but John there's got to be a reason why she was so invisible as a VP Mm-hmm. And, and 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 the rumor was was that she just simply wasn't good, and a bit like Joe, there's only so long you can hide that. It's a it's a rigorous campaign. You there's nowhere to hide. It's like raw and there, and everybody in the world can look up where you're having your breakfast at any given time. Like you're exhausted, whatever. So if she doesn't have the ability. And there has to be a reason why they're hiding her as VP. That's going to start to show real fast. It's easy to dance on the stage and clap and laugh and scream and go, oh, my God, it's wonderful. And I accept the nomination and it's all great and happy days. But after a while, when that runs out and you start to be asked hard questions, people unravel. And yeah. I'm just I'm curious as to why she was so, so invisible as VP, because don't forget, up until a couple of weeks ago, he was the candidate for uh, Joe Biden was the candidate for presidency or for re-election. He was the president. He was, we now know, in a cognitively difficult situation and everyone around him knew that. And while they were busy convincing the public that there was nothing wrong with him and there was nothing to see here, they still didn't put her out. They still didn't have her out front and centre all the time. Why? Well, you do not think there was a risk there that it would have highlighted the fact that they thought he was he was a bit feeble if they started putting the VP out everywhere. I actually think, I think that might work against her. Months, she disappeared three months after he got elected. She did. That's true. No, no, there's no doubt in what you're saying. For, by and large, for most of his term of office, that's been correct. So, look, the good thing is, if you're if you're watching this and you're this, you 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 definitely want me to be wrong and Sarah to be right about this. Sarah has been right on U.S. politics a whole lot more than me this year. So, so she's probably right again. I just think it's always a very silly idea to kind of go down that road of convincing yourself that only one outcome is possible. No, there are clearly two outcomes that are possible. Um, oh, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that there's a long way to go. And I think that Trump, you know, and I I hear like all jokes aside about my soft spot for J.D. Vance. I think that that might prove to have been a mistake. Um, mm. Because even though I, you know, think like it's all funny or whatever, I think he's cute. Um, and I liked his book and stuff. Um I'm not sure he has the ability for the rigors of this campaign either. And who she picks and who he's up against might expose him. And I think that, you know, where whereas Trump thought in the moment that he needed somebody to play to their 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 base, um, mm-hmm. he might end up needing somebody to look like they're gonna be a watchdog for him. And also ultimately what this has done. And in a way that never occurred before, if you think about it, is that it has made it r- much more of an obvious live question. Are you up for the job of president mm-hmm. if this 80 year old, 80 whatever year old or whatever he'll be, gets sick, dies or whatever? And that's I don't think that people ever really considered, you know, the VP was a job in and of itself. And I don't think people considered before as much the idea of this person stepping into the main, the top job. You know what I mean? Like they didn't really play that out in their head. And now it's a very real thing. So what's just happened has made J.D. Vance as a concept much. People think about him much, much more as potentially the president. And I'm not sure his experience is enough for that job. And I think that that might end up being a mistake by Trump. And then he should have put somebody in there who made him look a bit more calm, a little bit more sane and a little bit and and, and had the experience Mm -hmm. um, take the top job if necessary. I, I want to mention, by the way, because there are two things is on 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 Trump. Uh, one one good, one bad. Um, one of the most interesting videos I saw was um, a video of him playing golf with uh, what's his name, the guy who won the U.S. Open, um, pro golfer. Uh, look up who won the U.S. Open. Go on his YouTube channel. That guy and Donald Trump is playing around a golf with him for an hour, and it's actually a really interesting watch. And it's it's a way to see Trump in a way that you don't see on TV, which is just his relaxed, normal self playing golf. I think what's surprising much most is it's just literally the same dude all the time. It's not an act. It's what you see is what you get. But the second point is, like, a lot of people forget he will be two years older than Joe Biden is now at the end of a four-year term, should he win one. And we've seen with Joe Biden how quickly decline can come once you cross that kind of 81, 82 threshold. So, so yeah, I, I, I don't think I, people are forgetting the degree to which age was an issue in the campaign and might still be for some swing voters. 
who didn't have mm. a choice up until a couple of weeks ago and now do. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. Anyway, we'll we leave it there. Mm. Um, well, I'm, you... I'm, um, I'm going to the Galway races next week. Oh, so, yeah. To the tent. Uh, tent, is it? Uh, do they still let you into the tent? No tent? The tent is gone. Uh, uh, um, what she means is the tent isn't a secret location. <laughs> I'm not going with any. I'm going with my family. Some of my okay. family are are half are half Galway, and and uh, I used to go all the time. Um, but I haven't been in a few years. But I'm going for Ladies' Day next week, so the podcast will be going out. But I will be already there. So if anyone's listening and they see me, come over and say hello. Okay. I'll be with all my cousins, and I'll be in high spirits because I'm going alone without any children and getting all dressed up. So very exciting. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a picture of you. You should do. You should do. Um, you should do next week's podcast in your Galway races outfit. No. So we can all adjudicate how well you looked. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, if you've been watching this on YouTube, and uh, I want to say, and you've still been having some technical difficulties. So if you haven't noticed the jump cuts through this episode, that is all due to the mastery of our technical wizard who always wishes to remain anonymous. Uh, and we're very grateful to him. Um, but look, hopefully you've enjoyed watching us. I imagine it got boring looking at our faces after about 10 minutes, but maybe you got 10 minutes enjoyment out of it. Um, and so, uh, if you're the person, if you're the person who has weekly for over a year commented nice video, we expect you to comment that this week. You yeah, finally we, got your wish. You better write nice video this week. We certainly do. All right. Well, listen, from Sarah and from me, thank you as ever from this for listening to us, for watching us, for putting up with us. Uh, we'll be back next week. But until then, have a great weekend. And that was another edition of The Week That Really Was. <laughs>